<laughs> okay, um, we're going to, uh, I, I just want to take a moment uh, to talk about the fundamentals of, uh, of what we're seeing here. So, um, you can clearly tell, or hopefully you can clearly tell, the difference between the original material in the wall and the replacement material that was done probably somewhere in the 1950s or so. Um, this is uh, this is an example. If y'all want to come a bit closer, you can. Uh, here you see the original masonry, and you can see this the staining and discoloration on the uh, on the surface of a joint, which uh, if I had some hydrogen peroxide, we could test. Uh, it may be evidence of, uh, of a color wash, I mean, not a color wash, but an oiling of these joints. Uh, the brick themselves are in good shape. Uh, you've got uh, the occasional uh, glazed headers uh, scattered throughout, um, and, and the brick are, are quite firm and quite strong. So there probably wasn't a lot of need in doing a full color wash and penciling on this structure. And they may not have even penciled. They may have just wanted to, to give that mortar uh, some water shedding to, uh, to close up the capillarity of that mortar, that water sucking action of that mortar. Um, you come in uh, and you see uh, in spots uh, this Portland cement. Uh, sometimes it just will flick right off. Uh, here you can see they, they did try to recreate the joint profile. This is a rolled joint. Uh, so they, they would have uh, struck their mortar. Um, this looks like it's uh, slightly weathered, maybe? Is that what you're thinking? Weather joint? Um, a, a weather joint, and then what they would have done while the mortar is still fresh, uh, they would have taken a, a piece of string or a piece of line. Um, does he have a... Uh, well, yeah. So they would have pulled a line from the center of the joint here to the center of the joint here. They would have popped it, which would have left a, a small indention in the mortar. And then using a, a pointing tool, this is, this is a, or a, a, a jointer, rather, they would have put the, uh, put the block up and then run right through the joint to create this joint profile. Now this is strictly a decorative thing, but to me, it's every bit as important as the color and the texture of the mortar. I, uh, I was on a project in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and I've got pictures of it uh, on my iPad, but it, uh, the joint, we couldn't quite figure it out. It was like there was red mortar going on, there was white mortar, and, and it was really hard to get a grip on what was going on. Uh, luckily, the owner was there, so we were able to uh, look behind the uh, the shutters where the work had been protected for the last 50 years or so, because folks don't use their shutters anymore. And uh, and what we found was that they had laid the brick in a common mortar. They had gone back and pointed with a very fine white mortar and struck it into a, a bird's beak or a V. Uh, then they went with a red mortar and tucked the top and the bottom of that joint with red so that only a small amount, about an eighth of an inch of the white was showing. So what was a, a standard kind of three-eighths of an inch joint uh, uh, now just appeared to be like an eighth of an inch. It looked very fine, very, very nice. Um, what they, uh, so, so I mean that's a pretty drastic uh, uh, display of what a, uh, a historic mortar joint uh, can be, but to me it's it's every bit as important as the character or whatnot. I mean, again, this this takes a little time. It takes a little bit of a, of an eye of detail. But can you imagine if we were pointing this area here and we took just a concave slicker and ran it down the walls and kind of gave it a, a concave joint? Uh, it would completely change the 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 appearance of the masonry. Uh, a lot of times, if you're looking for a uh, uh, an example or a, a hidden example or a protected example of, uh, of the joint profile. You're looking uh, underneath eaves or uh, underneath porches, uh, somewhere where it's protected from the elements. That's also where you're going to find uh, the, the most protected uh, examples of uh, oiling, of color wash, of penciling, uh, to really get a sense of uh, what your historic project looked like originally. Um, 
So, so down here you can see that they did try to recreate that, but certainly um, the color is not exactly right. Um, but also, of course, it's Portland cement. Um, David, do you want to add anything? Uh, this is uh, David Vaya, by the way. Uh, David's an old, old friend of ours. Uh, we've been working together for, what, probably 10 years? Yeah. Close to it. Um, I'm going to brag on David a little bit. He's probably one of the best monument guys I know. So when it comes to historic monument repair, cemeteries and whatnot, uh, you won't find anyone with the attention to detail as, uh, as David. Uh, he has been working in Florida. He's been working in Colorado for the last 10 years, 10 years and is uh, just now kind of settling back in Virginia. So we're, we're really excited to have uh, his level of expertise uh, right here in this neck of the woods. So. Just standing here, it's interesting for me to see how much lower you are. You're taller than most people <laughs> here, and I'm, I'm looking at the whole back row, looking yeah. down on you. One of one of the the uh, the no-nos with any building is to let water head towards it. And yeah. Something I look forward to is seeing at some point when this water is going away. These walls really aren't very flat at all. Have you glanced across I haven't. It? You, you cited it? Yeah, I cited it. The top's leaning in badly. Where the fireplace is in the center, it's moved down. If you cite across here, you'll see how much weight that, that fireplace mm -hmm. okay. This is considerably lower than there, and then you can see it go up higher. And one mm -hmm. of the, the beauties of, of these mortars is that they give over time. This has moved down at least an inch. This whole bit of masonry here has moved down mm -hmm. and bent but there's no cracking because it has just settled. Yeah, one of, one, one of the great properties of lime, and, and we touched on this uh, earlier when we were talking about how when you repoint with uh, Portland cement, how the lime goes into solution and leaches out, leaving mortar rot behind. Um, when that property functions correctly, it's quite a good thing. Uh, lime is what we call an autogeneously healing material. So as the, just like uh, David was describing, as this building has settled and the, the mortar, uh, mortar joints have cracked and, and developed micro fissures due to that movement, moisture gets into those cracks, dissolves a little bit of the lime on, in, inside the mortar and brings it to the surface and heals itself. Uh, that's why when you're looking at historic buildings, you don't see control joints every five or 10 feet uh, and certainly on, on great historic walls or, or the Colosseum in Rome, you don't find control joints because technically every single mortar joint in the structure is acting as a control joint. There's a lot more color in the joints over here. This is, I was here 10 or 12 years ago and remember marveling at the building. There was obviously another structure here for a while, some, something added, but this, uh, there's a lot more color and a little difference in color, even though it comes inside this, so it wasn't done just after that. But there's, uh, there's quite a bit of staining, and it, it's weathered differently. It has. And one thing that you can notice as well is a, a distinct discoloration where this work has been repointed in the past, uh, and it's holding moisture coming from the uh, uh, from the side of that, uh, that window extending down. You know, that work is, is really holding moisture and of course is concentrated uh, right there in that center where that work has been redone. Um, definitely not something that you want to see. And you can see what they were trying to fix by the accelerated decay uh, just below that. How long would that last? That, that Portland cement in there? Uh, you're looking at, uh, well, it depends on every application's different. Generally speaking, we're looking at a 30 to 40 year failure mode bes between the time that the, the mortar's pointed uh, or the work is pointed with cement and, uh, and a sufficient mortar behind has deteriorated and basically causes it to eject itself. So, so it's really not it failing. It's making everything else fail. Precisely. It's pushing it back out. Precisely. A good restoration repair using a traditional line mortar we should be able to repoint this work, and none of us here standing will, will need to fix it again. You're looking at a 50, 75, you know, 100 year repair uh, when working with lime because you're working with the material that's working with the building. 
could you tell us a little bit about how you would do that? How do you, you must take out some as you put it, take out the bad and put in the good? That's right, and that's what Jimmy is going to demonstrate. He was just here. Uh, does anybody have a bell? That I can... <laughs> oh, okay, very good. To remember on uh, historic buildings or any building, these bricks are uh, three and a half inches. I won't move that historical one. You know, these bricks are, are this deep. It's an artifact. <laughs> these bricks are this deep. If all of these joints had lost a half an inch in it's and it were still solid, it's no big deal. Now, it's lovely to see that that uh, joinery and it's the color and, and this face out here. But if this was all a half an inch in, structurally it would make no difference whatsoever. So, so when people see a, a little bit of loss and they get excited and maybe redo entire walls, and, and I've seen it done just where I was in Columbus, Georgia. There were, yeah, I just saw it. I was absolutely amazed. Thousands of square feet being redone when there were losses no deeper than this. And then this wall is also, well here with the chimney, it's probably five or six feet, but these walls are three, four whites. Mm -hmm. So to lose a half an inch is, is insignificant. Not a big deal. Yeah. But then you start losing all the integrity and the aesthetics of the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this stuff's as hard as a rock. I don't know what this stuff yeah. is. I, I put it's my hydraulic. finger <laughs> put my finger there and I thought I was gonna feel something no, soft. No, no, no. It's it there. is tough stuff. Without it's testing and when we did the mold analysis, we know from experience when you take a you can take a beaker and a mortar sample, a chunk about like that, and you have, uh, say, muriatic acid, four to, four to one, or uh, vinegar and one to one, something like that. And you drop a sample, and if it's a high calcium type lime, like oyster shell or fat lime, it'll fizz up and almost come right out of the beaker. And you take a hydraulic sample, you drop that in there, it'll start fizzing and bubbling, but it's gonna be real slow. And then the next day, it might still be all but broken down except a little bit. And uh, if it's a portless cement, it's just a hard chunk that's gonna turn green and slimy. So it's a little quick field test if you wanna know if you've got a cement mortar, drop it in vinegar or whatever, and if it just turns green and slimy, that's portland. Everything else breaks down, whether fast or slow, you know, that's a lime. So kind of a little quick field test is what that is. No, no. And, and this one was a very slow breaking down mortar, but then it's very hard at the same time, just with what it is. Yeah. And this vein of stone, possibly, we don't know, but most likely from here, Monticello had some, I think, and then towards Montilla. So you get that outcropping of limestone. So one, one thing that I would add real quick, when, when it, and we were talking about joint profiles uh, just a few moments ago, um, there, there tends to be a, a, a thing in the restoration industry where uh, where you you repoint and then you beat it with a brush to make it look old, you know that's good. It will certainly tie your wall together maybe a little bit better. But every time you strike a joint with a metal tool, there's a certain amount of cream that's going to come to the surface or latent. Now that latent is going to help seal up that mortar joint. If we knock it off, we are now basically increasing the capillarity or that water sucking action. So it's going to have a lot more suction than, than something that's been finished off quite nicely. So it's, it's very liable uh, to, to fail quicker. Uh, you know, you might get half the lifespan out of something that's been finished properly. And uh, but you di different profiles, when you start looking at a building, We've talked about that. Okay, mm -hmm. and then yeah. you find it so you don't want to change history at the same time because if this is, you do something, you have to look. The front elevation may be one thing, then you go to the side, it may be more utilitarian. So you don't want to apply what's going on here. You got to look at each wall to try to figure out what do they do? Because you may have the front wall, maybe Flemish bond and nice work, well, nice, well graded work and that sort of thing because they could have selected the better quality brick for the front, different joint profile. Then you come around, it may be a common bond, an English bond on the sides, and then it's a struck joint. So you got to watch, make sure you don't change history. You pick up on the same thing that they were doing too. So, Have you seen any joint difference between high and low in the same elevation? Uh, no, not, not that way. So I'm not saying that they didn't, yeah. but, 
but it's the most time whatever's going on. And this is referred to as the overhand. Well, it's kind of a... Yeah, it's more, more of a... Uh, I don't know, roly-poly, double-struck <laughs> kind of a... This, this is one I don't like, because it's... I don't care until you start getting into it. Uh, it's a, you end up, you got to pick up on the style that they're, you know. One little trick, as we get in, well, I'm going to get into this anyway, but you talk about the hue that you got here with hot yep, oil. Really. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And uh, when you get into your strike, and say if you've laid it up, and I'll kind of try to demonstrate here, you can see how this is relieved. So you've got it pointing. First thing I would do, I'm going back and I'm trimming and cutting this thing as close as I can get it. I mean, I'm scraping. I'm trying to get back from brick to brick edge here. So that's the first step. Then you got to go through the striking process. And if you, for a brick layer, you throw a thumb on the side because this is ever so much. You don't want to dig in too much, but it's very subtle. You want to pick up the same style that they do. So with a little control with your thumb on the side of the trail there. And you see where I'm just barely running in, and they, that's exactly what they did. Then, they're, so it's almost forming a V. Poplar Forest was like this, but it was more, more of a pronounced V like that. Then after you uh, struck it with a double strike, this is, I always kind of figured this is more like a roll, because you get it here, and then they came around here, but it's not like a very pronounced V like Poplar Forest was with Hugh Chisholm was an Irish Mason who did the work there. So anyway, once you achieve the joint profile, then the next thing you do, you'd hold a line from the center yeah, of the we've joint. Yeah, we covered that one day. And then the snap it. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back. We're kind of working backwards. I'll go back and eat another cup. No, they were kind of interested <laughs> on uh, how you actually remove the Portland cement from the joint. I'm kind of working backwards. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah. Because so, that was easier. All right. <laughs> Because you're talking about snapping a line, you were talking about using a straight edge. Well, 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 yeah. First thing you do, you use a regular line that you're laying with. Uh -huh. Then you'd hold it from, because what you're doing is truing up the work is what they're doing. Now, if we had a, I don't have a piece of line with me, but if I had a piece of line on the wall, most likely this line, you know, the center of the joint would show up. Then, once you, it's called dinging the joint, once you snap it, you know, and you hit the line, the line hits that soft line, you get the little dimple from here to there, but that's a true line. Then, uh, with your joiner, this is using the rule, then you actually check it to, to the ding mark where you left that. So you check it, because you know, if not, you may be going this way or that way. And that's actually straightening the work out. And then you strike. Then you hook on, you see the ding mark here, hook on there and there. <coughs> And you take through. So the whole idea is you're straightening the work. They take a rough, irregular brick, and they're trying to make it look better. And we we take an old, a brand new brick and beat it up and make it look old. So we're both <laughs> going in the opposite direction. So I guess one of the first things we do when you have a joint, the uh, so when you go to remove the material, you want any of the friable material. You want to get back down to sound material. But typically a rule of thumb is one and a half times the joint. So if you're half an inch, half an inch here, three quarters to an inch back in depth is what you're going to be removing. The tricky part is with cement. These are pretty tough, pretty decent brick. Uh, I probably talk out of school for. Mm, I better not say that. No mind. Uh, but with cement, you you want to. I don't want to say it. How many bricklayers in the bunch? <laughs> uh, we just take it down, just right down the middle of it and then break it off. All right, just that's what it because you can go straight to hell if you uh, if you don't use a diamond and blade properly. <laughs> and depending on <laughs> what it is, end. the only thing I use a use one of those fine diamond blades, and I would score the center of this right down the center, and that's it. Most time I'd use a line pin after that to to chip everything away. Because once you you got to relieve the stress on this joint, but typically you know this is for the skilled mason on the job to do. You don't let the laborer do this. You just don't do it. He's got to be an old seasoned veteran, been with you for years, and then maybe you let him do it. I've been up on a job, and I can tell before I even see the guy. You hear that grind and just mm, that sounds pretty good. You hear that guy he's jamming the blade up in there every which way. Get him down. He's gone. <laughs> He's out of here. So that's what you do. But 
you come in and score this, and a lot of architects will specify you can't do it. You cannot use power tools. You cannot use an iron grant because they've already had their jobs butchered up. Then the next guy, they can prove with tools that they can damage the brick the other way. If you let them do it. So you got to kind of collaborate with them a little bit, and they have to demonstrate that they can successfully remove this and not damage the historic brick. One lady, an architect we worked with at the Georgia State Capitol, I think she had for every quarter of an inch, it was $1,200 fine for every quarter of an inch of stone, limestone. So if you got out of the joint, got into the limestone, it was $1,200 for fine. Yeah. $2,000 Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, Mary Catherine. <laughs> so she, she was a hoot. But anyway, <laughs> but, but she was good because you had to demonstrate your skill and ability as a mason to cut those joints out because it was tough stuff and it had to come out. And once you demonstrated and you showed the due diligence, it was okay and that's what they did. In this case, if anything, you can always just go right down the center of the joint I better put my glass on and see what I'm hitting. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> we we'll get far enough back, I won't be able to see that either. Well, yeah. Anyway. He's using a sharp line of hand. Yep. Good line of hand. Yeah. Yeah. That's so one of ours. Well, that bond tool is not a Virginia lime works tool. Anyway. We we have a few Virginia lime line pins floating around. With no notches. Huh? No notches. With no notches. Yeah. You ought to know how to tie a line on a line pin. You don't need notches. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good luck finding the supplier giving them away these days. It's crazy. Maybe some twigs or a pencil. Yeah. What about using one of these new um, oscillators? Yeah. Those. I was looking at doing some more. I heard this $3,000 bought one of these things to do something else, and they have a carbide blade that looks like. Okay. One thing, once we get it started, I've seen them. I broke the tip off of this one right here. This one is really the uh, uh, This is a little cheap tool that we have here. It's just a wood bit, three eighths wood bit. I broke it off. And I pass off our handle. So this is a little simple tool. So once you get it opened up and started, you can go over and. You know, clean it out. Gives you a lot of control too. That's one way of cutting it out. Another thing is you take a, I don't have, I forgot what we call them, it's just a skill saw blade and you put a handle on it and you've got the teeth from the skill saw blade, the old wore out blade, and you can just cut them out that way. That works pretty good too. And one other works, as long as you're not damaging the brick and you clean it out pretty good. Once you get back in there, most of the time I have a couple of these little pass all file handles and drill this because I end up going back into the depth of the wall and using like chopsticks to get the debris out and clean it then vacuum it and all that sort of thing. So that you're getting rid of all the Portland cement that's right there. Yeah, that's right. And then a lot of times I have a file in my little bag right there. Sometimes I'll sharpen the tip of that so I can, if you have some of this Portland on, on the outside there so I can Gently remove that, hopefully. Is there, is there any situation on building like this where you recommend leaving the Portland cement? Mm, uh, it's good. It needs to go. It needs to go. It needs to go. Because if you retain the moisture, then you're going to have deterioration. If not now, it'll be later. And that goes for in the basement as well. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the basement because that's where your moisture is going to be. Sometimes, once you get it started, you want to relieve it, you can just keep going, but then you go back. So if anybody else want to give a go, there you go, you just close this one. What? You're here. I'll try. Okay, go ahead. I couldn't see you doing that.
Hmm? Oh, uh, well, you should come on this side. Watch her. <laughs> Good. Jimmy, is this just as easy if the Portland cement is pretty fresh like somebody did it just a few years ago? Yeah, I, that seems like a tougher. <laughs> it is. Um, what you're hoping when you get up and uh, yeah. you sit. See Portland cement on it. You just keep your fingers crossed that they did a crappy yeah. job to begin with, <laughs> that they just kind of lipstick over what you got. But if they happen to cut it out and do a good job, you got your hands full. You're lucky that, I mean, you don't know how you're going to get along during the day. Then they come back and say, well, this is going to take you forever. Who wanted to do it over well, here? I didn't do it. I'm just trying to fix it. You know, so.